Well, praise the Lord. It's been a, it's been a week. It's really been a week. Last night, or yesterday, I sent a text to Herb. I said, Herb, I didn't say Herb. I just started with my complaints. I said, my feet been bothering me all week. I got back problems that been bothering me. Uh, had a funeral. My sinus, my head congestion, my throat was sore. I just been coughing and sneezing and hacking. And then the power went out. I told Herb, I said, somebody don't want me to get this message. And Herb said, I'm going to pray for both of your houses, the one with the power out and the one that houses your soul. He don't know he was on to something when he said that because that was kind of where my message is going today. So we buried, I like to call her my sister-in-law, Cynthia Wheeler. Uh, I went to the family hour, my wife went to the funeral, and then we, you know, we also had, she had to look after Deborah this week as well. And, and then I had some problems at work. Couldn't, I was in a do loop in, at work, trying to get something approved. I, I, I was stuck, I was sending emails, I was calling people, I was sending chats, can you help me, can you please help me? Then I remembered I knew somebody that knew somebody. So I called somebody and said, do you know the name of their boss so that I can talk to him? And uh, she said, let me look into it. Before she came back with the name of their boss, the two people I've been trying to call called me, fixed my problem, and it was squared away. Why am I saying that? Because after I, I talked to Herb last night about somebody making me sick, making me hurt, cutting off the power in my house, the funeral and the sadness in the family. I had every excuse not to be here today. I talked to Herb and Herb called somebody who was in charge. Amen. And Herb put some prayers in to somebody who was in charge. And all of a sudden a way was made out of no way. So I say praise the Lord because I had every excuse not to be here, but I'm here. And I thank God for that. <clears throat> I like to start off with a quotation and the quotation goes like this. Service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. Does anybody know who said that? Muhammad Ali. He was the first one to say that. He was the first person to get credit for it, although many others have came after him and embellished that phrase to make it their own. But I would ask this question. Does that, does that saying include service to God? Because there's a verse in the Bible, and I think we heard it in intercessory prayer. When I was sick, when I was in prison, when I was naked, when I was hungry. And they said, well, when were you these things, Lord, that we did these to you? And he said, when you did these things to the least, you did them to me. So service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. Muhammad Ali. So let's talk about that rent rent so you know a lot of us in the in in the, especially in the church of god body we, we we got this concept of owning our homes not being a borrower and that's self-evidence in the in the church of god community a lot of times i have never seen a bigger sample size of believers from all walks of life who are into owning their own businesses some people are into real estate uh i remember randy de los santos had an ice cream business I mean, it goes on and on. Some people in property management, uh, and it goes on and on. And, and believe it or not, I'm looking to retire in a year or two, and I've been so envious of that that I'm going to go out there and step out on faith and start my own business. I, I just think that that's something that we want to do. And, <clears throat> and, and I think that's a point of pride for most of the people in the church. And it is an admirable accomplishment, I do say. I even... For once, I'm going to say this, you know, people want to work for themselves. They want to have their own businesses. But I've actually heard up here at this lecture one time, someone said that if you have a job and you work for an employee, you're somewhat of a slave. I would say to that, that's your opinion. That's okay. That's your opinion. Because I remember what Paul said. Paul said, if a man did not work, he shall not eat. He didn't say if a man didn't own his own business. He said if you didn't work. Somebody's got to provide jobs. Everybody can't own their own business. So when that was said, I kind of took it with a grain of salt. Uh, only slave I am is a slave to the Lord. Amen. That's the only slave I am. And I'm free indeed in that slavery. 
So that's why you should read the scriptures and study for yourselves to find yourselves approved, right? But back to the point. We teach and we exhort people to become homeowners, pay off their bills, don't owe anybody but love, et cetera, et cetera. However, in all that teaching and exhortation, do we teach tithes and offerings? Do we also understand that there's a debt no matter how much we pay in tithes and offerings that we can never pay back? We can never pay back the debt that Yeshua paid for us. But we always say we, we own our own businesses. We're not borrowers or lenders. We're, we're in debt. We're in big debt. It's bigger than that $300 million home mortgage. It's bigger than that $50,000 car. It's bigger than that debt where he went to Jared's. It's you in debt, and you can never repay that debt. But yet, sometimes we pat ourselves on the back over all the things we have attained and accomplished. We think that we've, <clears throat> by owning this, by having this, having all this stuff, that we've, we've, we're really on the right track to success. And this reminds me of a passage about a rich man who had everything he desired. So if I would ask you to we'll start with the first um, scripture, turn your Bibles to Luke 12. We're going to read verses 15 through 21. King James Version is where, usually where I park, but you can go anywhere you want with that. Luke 12, 15 through 21. And Jesus, he said unto them, Take heed and be aware of covetousness, for a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possessed. And he spake, and he spoke a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. The ground that he owned, evidently this man was some sort of an agricultural or a farmer or something like that, but the ground that God gave him brought forth plentifully. And he thought with him, within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room to store my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns, and I will build greater. And there I will store all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God, oh boy, but God, but God said unto him, you fool, you fool, this night your soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall all these things go to which you have provided? So is he that layeth of treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So when you tell your soul that you are content with the riches of this world, what you are really saying, or do you realize that you're really telling God that you have no need for anything else because you've mastered all the wealth and the accumulation of wealth in this world? Do you realize that's what you're saying? Because in the end, just like him, your soul will be required of you. And this is the focal point of my message. So I'm going to give you a good example. For some of you who have bought a home or thinking about buying a home or in the process of paying off your home or have bought a home and paid it off. Let's say when you purchase a home, more so than often, you acquire a mortgage. Some of us who are blessed, not me, can pay cash, but for the most part, everybody buys their home on a time-based loan, a mortgage. As part of that loan, the bank establishes a payment plan that not only accounts for the mortgage, right, but the principal and also the taxes and the insurance that is required to own a home. That concept is called escrow. The definition of escrow is something that is placed in custody or trust and taking effect only when a special, specified condition has been fulfilled. So it is something that is placed in custody or trust, and it only takes effect when a specified condition has been fulfilled. This escrow creates a relationship with you and your finance company, and it endures over a period of time. I'm going somewhere with this, folks. Stay with me. 
See, the Heavenly Father has also made a spiritual transaction with each and every one of us. Anybody who has ever lived on this earth, the spiritual transaction that the Heavenly Father has made with them has been made, even to this day, to the richest or the poorest person walking this planet. It doesn't matter. From Adam all the way up to the baby that was born a minute ago in receiving hospital, he has a spiritual transaction sort of an escrow with them. He has placed a piece of himself that gives us that relationship with him and it lasts beyond the grave all the way up until the day of judgment and then into eternity. I'm going somewhere with this. It started in the book of Genesis 2 and 7. Follow me. Genesis 2 and 7. And it says in Genesis 2 and 7, and the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. From that point on, from that point on, every person that was born up until this very day and even to the end of days has been given a living soul that dwells in his mortal body. So, however... For as, however as much as we think we are our masters of our own fate and destiny, we are simply leasing a part of the creator's essence, and that is what binds us to him. So no matter what you think you have, you're walking around with someone else's property in you right now. Every one of you. I would like to, <clears throat> excuse me, I would like to um, title today's message, Matters of the Soul, because the soul is the most precious gift we have, yet we can't really qualify or quantify its value, which leads me to the first point in my message, which I've said before, is everything that can be counted doesn't count, and not everything that counts can be counted. I spoke about this before. But I think I'm going to lay it down today. If y'all just give me a few minutes, I'm going to lay this down for you. With a little bit more understanding by referring you to the scriptures I found. And we're going to go to Matthew 16, 24 and 26. <clears throat> Matthew 16, 24 and 26. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Verse 25 says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. But here it is. For what profit if a man shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? <clears throat> we hear a lot of times about singers, rappers, entertainers, and all these people sold their souls to the devil. I don't know if that's true or not. And coming from humble beginnings, I don't know if I've ever been offered that opportunity to do that, but I thank God that that was one temptation I never had a chance, you know. For those of you who know, I had a very promising rap career in my early, early years, but I decided that uh, I would follow the, um, the way of the cross, and I shunned that life of uh, grandeur and whatnot. And so here I am, praise the Lord. Maybe I'm embellishing that a little bit, but I did have 47 followers. I'm just gonna say, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, so y'all don't think y'all just talking to anybody up here, you know? So let's get back to the point, forgive me, Father. So Christ himself asked us to consider just how valuable the soul is and that all the wealth in the world does not to equate to the value of just one soul. All the value of the earth is not even equate to the value of one soul. And there's what, seven, eight billion people on earth, maybe nine by now? Nine billion souls on earth. If you took all the money from everybody in the world, it couldn't pay for one soul. Mm. You can't put a price on it, nor can you equate its value to anything in this earthly realm. Because of this revelation, 
we can only assume that whatever value it has transcends all earthly domains and thus has an importance to the owner, or in this case, the creator. If you own something outright, then it has value to you, and therefore it is important to you. So this brings me to my second point, which is your soul belongs to God. Amen. Where are you going with this, Chris? I'm going to the Bible with it. That's where I'm going. Go to Ezekiel 18 and 4. I'm not going to sit up here and just tell you stuff. This is not opinion. This is what thus says the Lord. Ezekiel 18 and 4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also is the soul of the Son is mine. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Furthermore, let's go to Romans 13 and 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. What does this mean? When it says that the soul that sins shall die. What does that mean? We all have been taught that the soul is immortal. But now we also see that it comes from God. So that means it's subject to him as well. So if you own something outright, you have the authority to do with it as you will, to include dispose of it as you see fit. So that leads me to Matthew 10, 27 through 29. Matthew 10, 27, 29. Here's something here to learn. What I tell you in darkness that you speak in light, and what you hear in the ear that you preach upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. The soul that sins shall die. Your soul does not live on forever. Your soul goes back to its owner, and he disposes of it as he sees fit. Think about it, brethren. When you own something that is pristine in value, and you loan it out, and when it's returned to you, you expect it to come back to you with some usefulness still to it. To make it simpler, I'm going to give you an example. Let's say I bought a brand new shiny shovel from Home Depot. It's in great condition. You know how they had those shovels sticking all shiny and, and hanging on the rack. However, I loan it out to my neighbor because he has a need for it. And when it comes back to me after my neighbor is done with it, I expect the shovel to be in a condition where I can use it for my purposes when I need it. Now, it may have a few scratches because it's being used for a purpose, so I don't expect it to be pristine, but I do expect him to give it back to me in some good condition. I don't expect the stick to be broken. I don't expect the blade to be warped to the point where it's a piece of junk because I can't do nothing with it. But the father, he'll take you in no matter what condition you're in. Whether you're broken, warped, twisted, he'll, bring, he'll take you back and he'll restore you to that pristine condition. I can't do that with the shovel from Home Depot. I just got to go get another shovel. But the Father, since he made me, he can recreate me however he wants me to. Amen? So to me, it's a piece of junk. But then I'm just giving you an example. You borrow something from somebody and you return it back to them. Put yourself in the place of that person, that neighbor who borrowed, and, and, and put that shovel as your soul, and just, just oppose that and figure out how that works for you. How you think God feels about the soul that he's loaned you that he's going to come back to get? What condition do you think he expects it to be in? Now, he doesn't expect it to be pristine because the only soul that was ever pristine was Adam and Eve's. Ever since then, there's been some deans and scratches, right? Still in good working condition, but it was a little scarred because that thing called sin got into that equation. So the shovel didn't have as much shine and glitter as it did as it, when it was in the garden. You know, you know, when you buy something new like at Home Depot, it looks great. You go back and you look at your shovel in your garage and you go back to Home Depot and go, I, I got a shovel just like that, but it don't look like that one no more. It's got a few dings and scratches on it now, don't it? As we go through life, we're going to get some dings and scratches. They call that fair wear and tear. Fair wear and tear. 
So that is my third point, which is born from this principle. If our souls belong to God and throughout life it becomes scarred or blemished through rough or through fa fair wear and tear, it is our duty and responsibility to properly maintain it as best we can so that we can show the creator we did our best as stewards to protect and keep our souls in the best condition possible. First Peter 4, 14 through 19. First Peter 4, 14 through 19. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, be happy for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, evil, let me get that right. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. So what he's saying there is people will talk about God, blaspheme about God, disrespect God, but do not let that bother you. You still glorify him for what he's done and is doing in your life. Yeah. Next verse. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. First of all, man, you ain't got no business gossiping like a woman anyway. I'm just going to put that out there. Some of you men need to start acting like men and stop getting out of this, get out of women's business. And then women, the Bible says y'all need to stop gossiping too. Y'all need to stop gossiping too. Busy body and other men's affairs. But there's some other evils here. Stealing, murderer. Yes, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin where, folks? At the house of God. What shall be the end of them that not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous can scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? If we expect to bring people to Christ, we need to get our act together. We're going through judgment right now so that that Second resurrection won't have no over us at all. So we need to get it together right now. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Keep your souls together, folks. Take care of your souls. Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. See, I said it before and I'm going to say it again. Your soul will never be as perfect as it was when the Father breathed it into Adam. But it still has intrinsic value to its owner, and it is salvageable. Therefore, it is incumbent upon all of us as tenants to keep our souls in good working condition. Going back to my shovel analogy, when the neighbor returns my shovel back to me, I expect it probably won't have that new store shine anymore and possibly have some scratches and some marks on it. However, I don't expect him to return it to me filthy and muddy. So my point is, <clears throat> I expect it to be returned to me as clean as possible. And I can overlook some of the dings and scratches. I can overlook that because I expect that. Life is going to give us some dings and scratches. The father expects that you're going to have some scar tissue when you come back to him. That just shows that you're an overcomer. That's all it is. You're an overcomer. And that's the same expectation he, uh, expectation he places on us when it comes to matters of the soul. He expects throughout your life there will be some scars and marks on your journey, but that doesn't mean he wants you to return it back to him filthy. You don't go back to him filthy. If somebody borrowed my shovel, and let's say they were shoveling manure, I would expect you to clean my shovel very thoroughly before you return it back to me. It should not have any remnants on it whatsoever because I gave you something and I entrusted you with something in a sort of an escrow relationship. Once you satisfy the condition of whatever you needed to do it with, do with that shovel, you bring it back to me in the best condition that you can. Where am I going with this? Like I said, the Father doesn't want you to return your soul back to him filthy. 
2 Corinthians 7, verses 1 through 4. It says, 2 Corinthians 7, 1 through 4, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Mm, I think we talked about this in the prayer. <laughs> Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man or woman. Or woman. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorifying of you, for I am filled with comfort and I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. So, we got some cleaning up to do. Sometimes, you notice, you can just get dirty just by walking out in the street and coming back in the house without really even doing nothing. I've, sometimes I, I've, I, I've taken a shower, and in the summertime, because of the mosquitoes, I put that skin so soft on me. And you rub it long enough, it turns to dirt. It turns to dirt. I just got out the shower, but I'm generating some dirt. I'm generating some dirt. I'm getting there. So in this, in what I just read you in Corinthians, Paul is beseeching the church of Corinth to remain steadfast in their spiritual walk to shun behaviors that place the soul in jeopardy. As an aside, I want us all to consider something. We all come from dirt. But that doesn't mean we got to take on the character of filth. I'm going to say it again in another way. We all come from dirt, but that don't mean we got to do dirty deeds. As I look upon this church, all I see is dirt, to include myself. I see some good looking dirt right there. And, and I know some of you feel the same way about your wives, but we're all dirt. We're all dirt. The father looks past the dirt, and he looks at the investment he has on the inside of this shell, <clears throat> this other house that the brother prayed for me um, when my power went out and I was going through the sickness and I didn't think I was going to be able to stand up here and give you this message. The father looks at that house and he looks at how well that house is maintained. Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes 12, 6 through 8, I had to read this and I had to go through some concordances because it was, uh, it was just really deep because Solomon was one of those very, he was, he, was, he was the wisest man in the world. So when he spoke, you, gotta, you had to understand what he was saying. And so I went to some concordances, and I did some serious study on this. And I was like, man, Solomon was really ahead of his time. So it says here, or ever the silver cord be loose, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Next verse. Then shall dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God, who gave it? Vanity of vanities, said the preacher, all is vanities. See, Solomon is speaking from a place of understanding in a time before this age we live in. So let's parse this scripture to get an understanding for our time. First, Solomon is eloquently speaking of death using metaphors and allegories that equate to human physiology. The cord he speaks of is the spinal cord. That is the nervous system that connects to your brain and all parts of the body. When viewed from an x-ray, it shows as a, vi a brilliant white silver string of nerves that looks silver to the naked eye. The silver cord be loosed. The wheel is the heart engine which pumps blood through the systems of the body. And the cistern is the organs, kidneys, liver, that assist in processing the fluids throughout the body to hydrate the skin and other organs. Solomon is talking about how these functions start to deteriorate at a point in time in life. Then in verse 7, he explains, After all these key body functions no longer exist, then shall dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. And that's the key takeaway here, is that the body is to return to dust from which it came. But the spirit, or the soul, goes back to the owner. I'm going to tell you something. It ain't just you, but everything on this earth came from dirt. 
the car you drive, the wheels on that car, the, the material that builds this building, the chairs and the material you sitting on, everything came from the dirt of the ground. Somebody dug it up, mined it, refined it, manufactured it, and put it together and made it into something. Nothing came from out of space except the creator who came and created us. I don't know where he came from, but he came from somewhere. But everything he used and everything that we're using comes from this earth, comes from this dirt. Brother Charles has got on a very nice suit. I didn't know dirt could dress up so good. But there you have it. Everything is dirt. Everything is dirt. Revelations 6, 8 through 10. To that end, we know that our bodies are gone and the living soul belongs to God, but it lives on. In Revelation 6, 8 through 10, it says, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given to them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. Next verse. And when he had opened the fifth seal, pay attention. See, we see things and we don't pay attention. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? What is my takeaway here? I'm glad you asked. See, when the soul is returned to the Father, it still has awareness. Now, Solomon said the dead know nothing. But that goes back in the ground. The body goes back in the ground. The soul returns to the father. The father has a value to it. So it, it has to have some sort of awareness. They're crying out for justice. They're crying out for vengeance. The soul is self-aware. But the good thing about the soul is he's no longer concerned or she is no longer concerned So with this world. So I pray for Sister Cynthia. I prayed. I put oil on her. I haven't brought the oil back, and Herb is reminding me to bring his oil back every week I show up. But I will bring you back your oil. Should I be disappointed? Should I be mad at God because he didn't answer my prayer? No, I have to grow up and realize he did answer the prayer. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes he knows better. Come to find out she had been sick for a long time, and we did not even know it. And she kept it from her own family. And me and my wife were just sitting back reflecting on some things that had happened when she came over and we saw her in certain moods and we couldn't figure out what was going on with her or why she was behaving a certain way. And then it started to make sense. She had bone cancer and it got into her organs and there was nothing left to do because she at some point faced the fact she was ready to go see the father. She was about to retire, which she would have, but she didn't get a chance to retire. She wanted to spend time with her grandkids. She was the grandmother of grandmothers. And I told her, look, it ain't a competition. If you want to take them to Disneyland every year, you go ahead. I'll take them once and then that's it. That's it. But I prayed. I prayed. I went straight to the hospital, anointed her, anointed her husband. And I prayed and I had confidence that he could do it. He could do it. That she was going to go home. And she did go home, and then she died. Blessed be your name. He gives and he takes away. But my heart will still choose to say, blessed be his name. You see, she may not have been a Sabbath keeper, but Cynthia loved the Lord. Cynthia took her grandkids to church even when the parents wouldn't go because they was too grown. She would take her grandkids and make sure they were in Sunday school. She would be in church. I've been to her church. I visited at her church, me and my wife. So my soul, my soul is well. It is well with my soul. I don't know if she did enough because I don't know if I'm doing enough. But I'm not going to judge her. But I know the woman I knew 
the woman I met at the well. The woman who was going through some things that we didn't know nothing about. I knew that woman. And I'm happy. And I'm grateful. And I will still get up here every chance I get and say, praise the Lord. So, what does this all mean? What is the call to action for each and every saint that hears this message? What is the path forward? My beloved, the path forward is evangelism. We must proclaim to everyone that the souls that we bear are on escrow and the Redeemer is coming back to claim his rightful property. Since the soul belongs to him, he will decide if it's salvageable. He will look and examine to see if it's clean. In the Bible, it says our righteousness is nothing but a filthy rag. But, see, he's going to look to see, you know, if you go to Home Depot sometime and you need something to be clean, they say, oh, you need this uh, cleaner X or, or, or some, some fancy chemical name. You need this certain solvent, and this will remove rust. This will get rid of that. He's going to be looking for a solvent. He's going to be looking for this solvent. And this solvent is going to be a special solvent that covers a filthy soul. This solvent is a solution so powerful that it wipes away the stain of sin. Oh, this solvent is so powerful that even, even when you don't think that you are worthy enough, this solvent stands in front of you and represents you and say, I will cover this person. That solvent, that, that, that solution is the blood of Jesus. I said the blood of Jesus covers and it's a solution that removes the stains, removes the filth, removes the, imp the impurities of your body. That's what he's going to be looking for on that day when he comes back to redeem his souls because they all going back to him. Some he going to keep, some he going to throw away. Every bottle we don't recycle, some bottles get thrown in the trash. The ones that's worth a dime, they go to Maya. The cans and bottles, for, you, for those of you out there who know about deposit and returnables, I'm just giving you a euphemism or analogy that you can identify with. But some bottles and cans or souls are not going to be redeemable. They're going to just be gone. Yeshua alone, his blood is what saves your soul. If you have it, then glory awaits. If you don't, then you'll be discarded into eternal darkness. So saints, protect your souls and try to help others protect theirs. So how do we do that? Turn your Bibles to the final of the scripture, and I'm going to read to you today. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of the Father Yahweh? For you are bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That is being the focal point of why we even exist. How be it that we tried to cram all these unclean spirits into a place that was not meant for them to dwell? Folks, tell somebody out there who don't know that their soul matters. Their soul matters. Your soul matters. There's nothing more valuable in this world than your soul. And that is the most important matter of the soul. Happy Sabbath. Y'all be blessed.